Welcome to Keep the Game Beautiful podcast. Each week, I highlight incredible people who are doing amazing things in soccer, the beautiful game. I'm Anna Turi, your host. Thank you for listening. It's really cool to think that I've been podcasting for almost a whole year. I'm very excited about this milestone, and I'm thankful for all of the people who have helped me get where I am today. For the anniversary of Keep the Game Beautiful, my dad is going to be interviewing me. He says he's planning on asking and saying a few embarrassing things, but I don't know exactly what he's planning on for sure. As everyone starts getting back to the field, it's great to be ready for the season with Duke Tig Notebooks. They've been big supporters of me since I first started. When I talked with today's guest, Jess Nash, we talk about starting to coach right after college, some of the ways she's making coaching pathways for women, and how important it is to have support around you. Sometimes the support may be family, your athletes, or other coaches in your coaching network. We all need to be there to support one another. Something I really liked about this podcast is a few times just turned around the conversation and she started asking me questions. I think as coaches, it's very important that we take time to do things like this. And I know in her coaching style, caring for the athlete like this is very important to her. Today, I'm talking with Jess Nash, Director of Coaching at Rush, Wisconsin. Jess played collegiately, collegiately at Buena Vista University in Iowa and earned the role of captain her junior and senior year. She worked as a student coach at Buena Vista University and then coached at numerous levels, including within the ODP program and now coaches at Rush Wisconsin Soccer Club. She holds the USSF B license and is a grassroots coach instructor. Jess is involved with both We Coach and the Wisconsin Women's Soccer Advisory Council. Jess, is there anything else you'd like to share about yourself? No, that's, you've got it all. That's awesome. Good introduction. Thank you. <laughs> On this podcast, I always start with the same three questions. So first, what does the beautiful game mean to you? Um, well, it is definitely a bit of my cornerstone um, as a, you know, personally, um, you know, I've played it all my life. And I mean, what's wonderful about this game, what's beautiful about it is that it's, you know, played around the world. And it's the world's game. Everybody can play it really anywhere with very little cost. Um, but, you know, personally, like I said, it's, you know, my interest. It's my passion. It's a, a major part of my community. Um, and I, I definitely feel honored every day to be a part of it, um, at, you know, working in it as, as my career. So, What are actions or things you do to keep the game beautiful? Um, that's a good question. One of the, one of the things that, uh, I try to do as a coach personally is I try to keep players playing. Um, really as simple as that is I just want players to stay in the game and, and not move on to not re retire as that, that's a new slogan. Don't retire kids. Um, but, uh, or move on to different sports. I mean, they can if that's their, their choice, but just to keep kids playing sports, um, and one thing I believe that we can do as coaches to do that is to keep it fun. Of course, keep it challenging and, um, um, and, and making sure you're knowledgeable as a coach to bring the best possible sessions forward to help players develop and grow. Um, but it needs to be fun at its core because that's why people and kids keep coming back. And, and I guess as, as my role as a director and an instructor, I, I try to help coaches – I meet coaches where they are in their development to, to be able to do the same with players, with that, with that underscore of keeping it fun. How do you encourage others to keep the game beautiful? Um, I definitely encourage others to seek out knowledge, you know, whether that's a course or, um, you know, reading books, podcasts like yours, but to keep, keep getting educated on, on the topic because, um, you know, coaching a U9 player is, is much different from a U19 player and, and you need to, and coaching a college player and professional player, you need to be able to know how kids learn, how adults learn. 
and how that's different and how you can tailor your approach to your population you're working with so that they stay in it and so that they can give back to the game eventually to keep it beautiful. So I just want to go right into it. And how and why did you decide to coach? Playing in college and um, I, it was I pretty much my, I think it was my junior or senior year. Um, and, you know, I had been, I was captaining and I was having a blast with my team. And, and I just really thought that, you know, this is the direction I want to go. I was very vocal about it with my coach. I said, I want your job. I want you to teach me how to become a coach. Um, and luckily I had some, uh, both the men's and women's coach um, kind of took me under their wing and they, they said, why don't you become a student coach and help us, you know, after fall season to be a student coach in the spring and winter um, to, to help lead, lead diff- a couple different things. And they took me on a recruiting trip actually as well. So that was really huge for me to see how, college coaches recruit, uh, what they look for, kind of, you know, give me an insider's view on that process because um, normally when you think of coaching, you just think of the on the field stuff. But as many college coaches know, that's only a tiny, tiny percent of your job as a, as a college coach. And um, quite a bit of it is, is recruiting and maintaining relationships. So once, once we kind of went through that process, I knew for sure that's something that I wanted to do. And Um, I had applied to a couple different opportunities after college, after my undergraduate, uh, degree, and I had the opportunity to go to Kansas, um, to be an assistant coach at a community college or to go to Iowa, be an assistant at a brand new program, uh, at a community college while getting my master's at Iowa State. And so I, I decided for the latter because I, I was very interested in getting my master's and alongside knowing the ropes and, and getting to learn the ropes and um, and to also help build a, a new program sounded really amazing. And so that's kind of how I got into it. Was it hard to be a coach at Buena Vista, like coaching players and then having played with them previously? Yes and no. I mean, cause, because it was only winter and spring. And because I was the captain already, I was already sort of in that leadership role. It was a little bit difficult because after season, you know, everybody kind of wants to do their own thing for a little bit. Um, So corralling the troops to get back into workout mode was a little difficult, but not, it wasn't that hard of a transition, like I said, because I was previously in that role. Is there any advice that you would give to someone going through a transition like that? Yeah, I think... Seeking out help from mentors is is really helpful. Um, you know, at that time, my mentors were my coaches, and you know, I I got to see what what they did really well, and some things that I might do differently. And anybody going through that transition should, you know, listen to their gut and build on those relationships that they that they have, or try to build new relationships with those athletes that they might not have. Um, to make that transition a bit easier. Going off your mentors, how important was the mentorship that your coaches gave you when becoming a coach? Um, it was it was really important um, because they gave me insight into things that I, like I said, I didn't know. And also, I mean, I mean, just even I've been I've been out of college, oh, gosh, since two thousand nine with my undergrad, so eleven years and. Six months ago, I'm I'm still getting messages from from them saying, "Hey, there's this opening," or you know, whatever. Just kind of always staying in touch and letting me know of opportunities as they come. And um, you know, I check in with them too. And um, I think it's it's really positive to know that there's, you know, even if we go a long time without talking, there's somebody in my corner um, that believes in me and um, believes that I can do this this job. So <laughs> it goes a long way. Do you think having a supportive coach like that in your past affects the way you coach your players as well? Oh yeah. 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 And you know, I have, I had a really big support system in my family and my, my family community as well, where, you know, growing up, I was really lucky to have a family that said, you know, you can do anything, you know, we, you know, we love you. We, we believe in you. And so it really gave me that confidence to be able to 
take on any challenge or try some new things because you know, it's really difficult. Change is difficult and trying new things is difficult. But when you feel like you have people behind you that are supporting you, it makes all the difference, I feel. Was confidence something you always had as a coach or did it take time to develop? Oh, it definitely took time to develop. Yeah. Um, Because I went from playing college to coaching college. And so it was quite difficult, at least in my eyes, you know, I felt insecure in that, you know, why should these girls listen to me or women? Why should these women listen to me when, you know, I'm just a couple of years, a few years older than them. And so I felt I had a big insecurity about that, but also knowing that players pick up on insecurities and you need to be a confident leader in order to be, to feel like they can be confident too. And so One thing that I always have said and have tried to live and keep reminding myself in moments of insecurities is just fake it until you make it because, you know, obviously I've, I've done, you know, a lot of self-educating and I I read on my own time quite a bit and I'm always trying to improve myself even then, but in moments of where you don't feel quite prepared, you kind of just have to fake it till you make it because otherwise, you know, nobody's a hundred percent prepared for any new job or role because you haven't done it and the only way to to kind of gain that expertise and experience is to go through it so strong believer in fake it till you make it (laughs) so were you actually ever uncertain or unsure as a coach oh yeah yeah definitely like I said but I think you know surrounding yourself and this is with anything really like surrounding yourself with good people knowledgeable people people who are trying to um, excel themselves and make themselves better is only going to help you not only to improve your confidence, but to, to grow faster. And, and that's just not with, you know, your career or coaching or whatever. That's, you know, your friends, your, you know, your community, who you, who the people you surround yourself with should be those that inspire you, that you want to learn from, that you want to grow along with. Have there ever been any times where you were the only woman coach in the room? Oh, yeah, plenty. I mean, to this day, <laughs> in my club. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, you get used to it, unfortunately. But, um, you know, I'm trying to, to change that, you know, little by little. And luckily, I'm in an awesome state of Wisconsin, where um, I've got some good friends doing some amazing things with the women's a Wisconsin Women's Soccer Advisory Council and trying to get women to stay in the game and and grow the pool of women coaches and referees and administrators. And so, you know, I see a lot of, I see a lot of hope there. And certainly I'm, I'm doing what I can at my club level to recruit, mentor uh, women coaches. And I I really hope that that's not a question you have to continually ask (laughs) on your podcast soon enough. What are some of the things we can do to get more women and girls in the game? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's a common question. Um, and the Tucker Center of Research at the University of Minnesota does a great job at kind of going through the why behind it. You know, there's, there's, you know, people hire people that look like them. And as you'll notice with athletic directors across our our uh, our college landscape and directors of coaching and technical directors across our club landscape tend to be male and um, they tend to hire people that look like them but then and act like them and coach like them too and and that's you know no different than anybody else you know you you hire within your circles and you hire people that look like you Um, but we need to do a better job of expanding our network of reaching out to those Um, organizations that uh, have a network of women in their organization, like We Coach is one of them. Uh, Wisconsin Women's Soccer Advisory is another. Your state association. And then also build within. uh, You know, a program that I've been working on the last couple years with Rush Wisconsin is the Emerging Coach Program. And that's, you know, you can argue left, right, and center why you can't hire a woman coach because there's none available or they, you know, they – they're just not around or none are applying or whatever. You can make any excuse or, you know, you can just promote within 
and look at your high school athletes and say, okay, who, who is, who would be a good coach? You know, who do I think, or who's interested in coaching, you know? And so thinking about how we can get players engaged in the idea of thinking about it, because oftentimes what I've seen and research shows is if you haven't seen it, then it's hard to really think that you're able to do something like that. So, so if, if you have high school girls soccer players who've never had a female coach before, they're going to think, you know, they might think it's, uh, it's not possible to coach. And so with, with this program I started, we, we kind of promote high school girls into getting into, into coaching by paying for them to attend a grassroots course, uh, USSF uh, soccer grassroots course, and attend the Women's Soccer Advisory Council Symposium. And, and throughout that process, it's about six months, they, they get mentored by a person in the club and get to try to, you know, run some sessions and observe some sessions and reflect on it. Um, so that hopefully when they're done with their playing career, they'll think of getting back into coaching after they're done playing. You had talked about having other women coaches coach young women and girls. Why else is this important? Well, it's hugely important to see, to, to have role models that look like you, you know, lets you know that you can achieve that too. You know, it's, I think, I think that's huge is, is the visibility and, and to be able to know that, Hey, I didn't know that was possible, but now I see somebody that looks like me there and, and maybe I can do that too. As a female instructor, are there ever times where participants are surprised to see you leading the class? I don't know. I, not that I've noticed, definitely not when I teach the women's only courses, because <laughs> I've taught, uh, I've sat in on one and I've, I've taught another, um, but yeah, not that I've, not that I've noticed, um, I think if you, I don't know, maybe there are, but I think if you come in and you're confident, um, and, you know, you bring your expertise and you're professional, um, you don't really leave room on the table for, for anybody to second guess you. So through ODP and the National Rush Coaching Opportunities, you've seen some amazing players. What do you look for when evaluating a player that to com- that comes to compete at this level? Well, definitely. I mean, you always look for, you know, the four pillars of whatever age group you're coaching, if they're meeting those um, benchmarks of, you know, technical, tactical, physical, psychological. Um, but at the ODP level, because – it's different from club where you're bringing in kids from all over the state to play together. Um, and you might get, you know, uh, a group of, you know, 90% of them are midfielders or forwards or defenders, or whatever. It's really important that, you know, you're picking, you're looking for the best 18 to make the roster, but you're also, you know, they might not, fit the position they've been playing you know or you think within this group this is a different group from their club back home and you're playing a different formation you need you need uh, players to be adaptable and coachable Um, so I definitely look for that and when I say hey try this position how do they react Um, do they own it are they scared at first do they grow in it you know maybe it's not the first session but maybe second or third or fourth session are they are they growing? Are they starting to take on the challenges that you're giving? That coachability is huge because it shows how how adaptable they are. Um, because, you, you know, I'm sure you know, Anna, that you, once you move from coach to coach, level to level, a coach is going to see different attributes in you and how they fit in the team. And, you know, what you play and, you know, as a U12 players might not be what you play at high school or even college so you have to be able to adjust to those challenges. Do you think like being adaptable could be taught to a player? I think so I do I think you know some sometimes you know for the last few years I've been I've been coaching the U13 level with with the girls uh, in Wisconsin ODP. And a common thing I see is the girls, this is their first 11 v 11, playing 11 v 11, that age group. And also they're, this is their first year playing competitive ODP. And they're timid, generally. 
uh, every year. And so uh, oftentimes I have to go through uh, a series of conversations with the players about, hey, you need to be able to communicate to your team. Not You're not yelling, you know, you're not um, – you know, bossing them around, but you need to communicate, especially goalkeepers, because uh, it can be very intimidating with a new squad and all that. Some goalkeepers and some players rise to the occasion, some don't. Um, but, you know, I think where I then try to then go to a second level is get to the reason why they don't feel comfortable. What's holding you back from from communicating this idea? You saw it. I know you saw it. What What's stopping you? And then you know, kind of going deeper, what what could you say here? Exactly what could you say? Shift, drop, you know, push up, you know, 2v1, you know, whatever it is. We go through examples to get specific so they're not wondering what they could say. Um, you know, that's just one specific example of talking, you know, and communicating an idea in, a, in an environment where it might be, where they might feel timid because it's new and challenging. Um, but I think you can get there. I think you can teach adaptability by digging deeper into the why I think if players start thinking about why am I rejecting this idea or why am I not doing this it might help them uh, be more adaptable in the future in that adjusting quicker does that make sense yeah mm-hmm. what are some of the things you've learned as a coach by participating at this level I've learned a lot. You know, I I really like the ODP environment because you get to meet coaches from all over the state. Uh, I'm lucky to have worked alongside quite a few that I deeply respect. And um, I mean, you, you learn if you if you have the time to yeah, in your coaching schedule to watch and observe others, do it. A hundred percent, because you're you're gonna gain something, whether even if it's at the very least what not to do. But I'm a strong believer, and if you have time, you run a session, come a little early, you know, watch the session before yours, or stay a little late, network, ask them questions. Um, but I think working in an environment like that is huge for learning, for asking questions, and for building your coaching community. So you've talked about mentorship a decent amount. Can you talk about some of the mentors you've had in your journey? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've had quite a few mentors um, from from all over, from different landscapes. Um, you know, of course, my college coaches, you know, my mentors, you know, my bosses in the past. Uh, certainly, um, coaches I work alongside. Uh, the you know with Rush National Select and ODP and in my home club, um, you know they're they're excellent. Um, and one of my like favorite mentors was actually she wasn't in the sport at all. Um, she was my former boss at uh, university I worked at, and I was working in first and second year experience and what a really good mentor does is they're supportive but I feel like they also challenge you in certain situations um and that's what she did and she was really good at challenging me to become better and she taught me a lot and you know so I encourage when I encourage others to look for mentors I say don't just look in your sport like who's around you that's going to challenge you to become better um because I think it's it's uh if you're working in a profession you often think that you just need to seek out people that are working right in your bubble but oftentimes it's that's not true so how do you support and encourage other coaches i honestly i i try i try to do the same with coaches as i do with athletes and meet them where they are because everybody's on a different trajectory learning plan and um and so I try to meet coaches where they are and see where they want to go. I'm, you know, so as a director, I'm, I have some coaches that have coached way longer than I have, but, you know, I still need to be able to provide them in a, a challenging and a growth uh, environment so that they are becoming better. And then I also work alongside coaches who this is, they're just getting into it. 
And so um, it's really important for me to keep educating myself on leadership, on different styles of leadership, because just like athletes, you know, you might be motivated differently from the next person. So working with different coaches is really important for me to figure out how they're motivated and how I can best suit their needs as a leader. And then also just try to continually learn and how adults learn. We, you know, I think it's really important for coaches to learn how children learn and how that is different at different age groups and how we need to adapt our coaching style for uh, for our athletes at different ages but we also need to learn if you're in a director's role and you're working with coaches or even an instructor um, you need to learn how how adults learn and how that's different from kids um, and so I'm, I'm I do quite a bit of self-educating myself to keep up to speed and, and trying to always reflect on what what am I doing that could be better why is team atmosphere and culture so important to you you know it's Life is just so much better when you have when you go through it with a team <laughs> and a community. I think uh, that's why I love soccer is because it's a team sport. There's just nothing better than working toward a common goal with a group of people. I think, you know, developing a culture is not an easy thing, but uh, I think if you have the right people on board and you have uh, the culture driven from the community of what whoever your community is, the players in this instance, um, I think that that it's uh, really rewarding when you find success. What may happen to a player that isn't a part of a positive team experience? Um, well, I know it's different for different age groups, and um, it's certainly different in the college and professional realms of what might occur in those situations. In in specifically the the youth ages that I'm working with right now in this moment, um, you know, a conversation typically needs to happen where the parents are involved and, and in some degree. You know, at first it might be uh, with the player and with, you know, with the team and saying, what are our team expectations? Do we all agree on this? You know, it needs to be player centered. Of course, whatever your culture expectations are and whatever your season goals are, those need to be thought up by the players and enforced by the players, I believe. And if you have a player that's not uh, kind of going with those expectations, typically the conversation could be had with the, with the teammates because of those established expectations already. Um, then if, that, if that's no longer working, you know, having a coach sit down and say, hey, what's going on? You know, what's, what's disconnect here? And um, especially with the youth ages, um, you know, Parents, having parents involved is, is important because uh, oftentimes with, with youth players, you don't know what the situation is, uh, whether they're having trouble in school or home or, or whatever. And getting the parents on board to help is, is I feel like, a important part of the process. How can training and games be competitive yet still fun? Um, well, I think games should always be fun. Always, um, you know, because you're playing the sport of soccer and soccer is fun. But also you're having fun when you're ha when you're competitive. I feel like competition is good. And I think that there should always be competition and trainings too. Um, you know, coming up with team names and keeping score and developing rivalries. And, and so I think it's not mutually exclusive where it's, you know, I think competition is fun. And that when you're doing your best out there and you're giving your all, that's when you feel like you're, you're having fun. Do you agree? Did it, yeah. Do you disagree? Mm -hmm. Oh, I agree, yeah. Has something yeah. like incorporating competition and, so, and having fun always been a part of your coaching style? I think so. Like, I, when I was a younger coach, I think I tried to get players to be competitive by showing my passion of competitiveness. Um, and that's a really egocentric way of coaching. Um, but as I've grown and educated myself through courses and reading, I'm trying to make it more player centered. And so giving the game back to the players and having them come up with ways and making it competitive. Okay, hey, what's the punishment or what's the what's the reward or what's your team name or, you know, cheering really loud when somebody scores, you know, um, getting passionate about winning, you know, and, you know, I think, 
I think that's, that's the difference. And um, uh, that's what I've learned in the process. Do you have any favorite punishments to watch your players do? No, <laughs> no. I, you know, at the, the ages now, I, I try not to, you know, I, I mean, I do push-ups and I, I definitely enjoy teaching players how to do proper push-ups. Um, but no, I mean, it's usually something really, we're not doing any big punishment or anything. It's just, you know, oh, you lost, let's, you know, it's 10 push-ups or whatever, you know. Um, or it used to be growing up and, you know, it, it was, you know, long suicide sprints and all of this. And that's not something, something that I see many coaches do anymore. I had read that you participated in the Best Buddies as a college student. Could you talk about this a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. We, um, I was involved in college um, through Best Buddies, and um, we, we were trying to get uh, more college students uh, on our campus to get involved. And basically, through Best Buddies, what it is is you sign up if you're a college student and you're paired with a best buddy uh, with um, any sort of uh, mental disability or physical disability and you um, or handicap or whatever and you, um, you just become best friends with them and you you hang out you do fun things you you um, go to movies you go bowling and so that experience is something I look back on and I really enjoyed my time in that program. Um, but also really enjoyed getting other students on campus to get involved. It was, it was fun. I was a part of that for uh, two years, yeah. I've been involved with the AYSO VIP soccer, and it's something I absolutely love to do. Have you ever worked with athletes in a program like this or top soccer? I have not, but tell me about your experience with that. So with AYSO, we have a few, few kids, a decent amount come out. And it's just a really fun opportunity. We usually do it at the end of our full Saturday soccer day with AYSO. And we've had a lot, we have a lot of new kids come and a lot of people that have been coming for years. And it's just a lot of fun. It's like the best buddies almost as well, where we are buddies and we just help them along and play soccer. That's awesome. So do you stay connected with that same buddy or does it change throughout the season? It kind of changes. It really depends. There's some players that really like to have their one buddy and some that really just love all the buddies. So, mm -hmm. How long have you been a part of that? That sounds awesome. I think maybe four years, possibly. It was something like it was when we first moved here. My coach from the AYSL program was involved with it and he basically ran it. So mm -hmm. he just involved, he told us about it, and it was something I really wanted to try out. That's what's your favorite memory from that? I don't know. There's a lot. I think maybe two years ago we really started like a Halloween theme almost, where everyone would dress up and we would have trunk or treating, and that's just really fun to see all the kids so happy and dressed up, and they get to <laughs> they can play in their costumes if they want to. Yeah, that's fun. We do trunk or treating too at our club, but yeah, that's something we'll have to look into. That sounds awesome. So how do you think we can get youth players to get involved and volunteer? I mean, it, it could be club driven. I know that there's a lot of high school students that have those requirements where they have to complete a certain amount of hours um, within their, you know, to graduate. Um, and so we encourage our uh our athletes to get involved within our club. We have different volunteer opportunities within our club, but then um, we've definitely done some things where we've worked out in the community uh, as a group. And so I think um, as a club, it's really important to identify those opportunities and make sure that your membership knows about it um, and to try to get everybody to participate. I saw that you worked in higher education for four years. Could you tell me a little bit about that role? Yeah, um, I worked in the first and second year experience department at St. Ambrose University near you in Davenport, Iowa. Uh, well, kind of near you. Um, and uh, that was a really cool experience because, um, you know, I starting out coaching, I knew I wanted to work with college students 
while I was coaching club, I was working with youth and I was, I also had just gotten my master's in higher education and I wanted to be able to utilize my education and also continue to work with college students. Um, and so I had gotten a job and at first I was working as an academic support specialist and in that role, we, we developed programming and initiatives centered around helping first year students uh, adjust well to college and, and uh, to move on to their second year and helping second year students, sophomores become successful in their second year. Through that, I learned a lot about how students learn, student development theory, um, how adults learn and how that's different. Um, and then also had the opportunity to, to instruct some courses, which, you know, I helped instruct a, like a first year seminar course, basically, um, and uh, service learning courses in the honors program. And that really created a foundation for me um, for the grassroots instructor license that I felt would give me a leg up in the in the course and, and in my um, experience now teaching. It made me feel a lot more comfortable walking into the classroom, I think, if I hadn't had that experience. And then also through that role, I got to advise students, and which is really very similar to coaching. A lot of what I was doing there was very similar just uh, to coaching and just didn't have soccer involved <laughs> in it. But I absolutely uh, loved my experience there and uh, grew so much as a person, as an educator, as a, as a coach, um, really, really uh, seamless uh, going from coaching to that, I feel. Um, and, and yeah, helped me, helped me a lot. As someone who worked with college students, what would you say about these uncertain times where we don't know how classes will be held? Yeah, this is crazy, huh? All of this. <laughs> We've, what, what I've been saying to everybody that I've talked to is that we're all in this together and nobody is unaffected by this. And, you know, I have a sister that is going into her sophomore year this year and she's trying to navigate, you know, she, she, Fortunately and unfortunately, went into college with, with many credits already that she got accomplished in high school. And so it's not, you know, I know some students are taking maybe a year off or attending community college um, where she doesn't have that, really that option. But um, many, many students right now are uncertain of what they should do. Um, and honestly, I don't think that's any different from any other person out there um, as, you know, as each state is wondering, each county, we're wondering what, what's best to do. Uh, and our leadership at every level is trying to figure this thing out. Uh, I find comfort in that we're all working on it together and we're going through it together. Um, and I think this has taught me a lot about uh, having grace, you know, and, and forgiving, you know, having grace for yourself <laughs> and for others who are, you know, having difficult moments. Um, and also yourself. I think it's really, really important right now to give yourself grace and forgive yourself for maybe having some some bad days or some down days or some not as positive days. And, you know, nobody's encountered this in our lifetimes, really. And so uh, it's really important to keep that in mind that, that it's okay and we're going to make it through, but we're all going through it together. If you were coaching collegiate, collegiately today, would there be anything else that you might say to your team about all of these uncertainties? I think it's really important to tell our athletes right now that it's okay to not be okay. I know that, you know, mental health has been a topic that, that's been requested to be addressed at, at different levels, you know, at higher education, certainly, in our, in our public education system, certainly, and, you know, United Soccer Coaches Convention, it's been brought up. But right now, I think with, with all of this uncertainty that it's, you know, what I would tell if I was coaching college now, it's just, it's okay to be okay, or to not be okay. Um, and that we're here to support you. And um, we'll make it out on the, the other end better for it. Because, you know, adversity is tough to go through, but often makes us stronger. We've made it to our final question, which I always ask. What do you hope people remember about your impact to soccer and the world? Oh, geez. I don't know if I would go that far, but I hope 
people just remember that I cared for them. Um, I, I hope that there's some female coaches that stay in because, you know, we, we coach together, uh, or they played or whatever, but I hope that they, they get in or stay in the sport because they, because we, we all cared. We care for each individual, um, not just the, the player, not just as a athlete, but as a person. Um, and I hope that, that, that last, that feeling lasts longer, long after I'm gone. I loved learning from Jess today. She had some really good insight, and I hope that someday I can take a class from her or at least come watch her coach. So many times when I talk to people, I hear about how hard they have worked to open the doors and create opportunity for other people. Jess is doing just that with her coaching and by leading other women in her work. I know some of you will be going back to your clubs or having games if you haven't already, of course. Make sure to be safe on the field, and until next week, remember to keep the game beautiful.